At times, my childhood felt like one of those old 1960s dairy ads. Each summer, my parents would farm out some of us kids to aunts and uncles in the country. We'd pile into the car and head north up Highway 99 to Aunt Annie and Uncle Chape's place. They ran a 30-head dairy farm on McLean Road, next to a slaughterhouse. When the milkman delivered each week to our suburban ranch house, I thought of Uncle Chape and his cows. He was the real milkman in my mind. I remember those overalls as well, with the bundle of receipts tucked in his front pocket. He knew what he owed and who owed him. Uncle Chape and Aunt Annie are gone now, and so is their dairy. Their barn holds used goods for Saturday rummage sales. As surviving dairies have gotten bigger and bigger, they have stirred public concern. Yet much of what people know about these farms comes from either the romanticized images in milk ads, Diane here speaks fluent French. Salut, mon ami. Avez-vous habité en Paris? Or the demonized portrayals of dairies posted online. I was suspicious of both of these simple portraits. My work as a psychologist focuses on stressful jobs, particularly jobs in places that have become the center of public anxieties. I wanted to learn more about the farmers that have kept afloat and how they dealt with the pressures that led so many others to go under. My first stop was a dairy just down the road from where my aunt and uncle lived. Oh, well, the next, that, that farm with the white buildings and the white house, and that's another farm there, but we own almost to that. Alan Mesman's dad worked the fields with my uncle Chate, and today Alan, his wife, and their two children are carrying on the family operation. These are the last pair I have of dairy stripe J.C. Penny bib overhauls that, that Sam Messman, my grandpa, wore. This happens to be dairy stripe. Um, there's also hickory stripe that's very close to this. And one time my mother couldn't find these in the store and brought home hickory stripe overhauls that then had to be taken back because my grandpa would only wear dairy stripe. Never wore bib overalls. That's not, that? that's not a product of my time. <laughs> There's a cheap food culture in this country. The price that we get for our milk uh, compared to all of our expenses, the margins have just gotten narrower and narrower over the years. To farm on a small scale in many cases is harder and harder. Many farms have just found the need to expand when we went organic in 2007, that provided us a stable price that helped us stay viable. There is one dairy farm that's smaller than us in Skagit County. I remember this one person, they had a thousand cows and it was this and that, and you know, just, you know, here we're next with our hundred cows, but you know, a couple years later, he was out of business. That's Ben and Sammy, probably about five and eight, so good kids. Sammy, I was hoping she'd go into agriculture. She had an excellent background in 4-H, and she was dairy ambassador. 
But I chose nursing, which I think is an excellent field too. <laughs> When my son Ben was a teenager, 13 or so, he had nothing to do with the farm. In fact, he just was not interested at all. Moved to Wisconsin. He met a girl actually at a 4-H conference. Weren't sure what was going to happen. You know, we're happy he became interested in the farm. There's, there's a lot to learn. After my parents got married in 1936, they bought a small house in Whatcom County, just south of the Canadian border. There were over a thousand little dairies when my parents settled in this area, and now there are around a hundred, although the remaining farms hold about the same number of cows as roamed the pastures 50 years ago. Ed Pomeroy owns one of those remaining farms. Farming is something where you've got to be in it for the long haul. Things change, but you can't change every time things change. My grandmother and my uncle lived up the road, and they had a dairy farm, milk maybe 30 cows, and the neighbor had about 30 cows. But most of them up there would milk 10 or 15 cows. If I got $5, I'd buy a day-old calf from somebody and raise a calf. I like to party and, and dance and have fun, but I've been getting up and going to the barn for 65 years. Saved your money and bought more land and raised more cows. And, just a gradual process. Today, we have like 2,400 milk cows. Probably one of the larger ones in Whatcom County. If there's somebody that can make a living with 100 cows, more power to them. I had a lot more fun when I milked 15 cows than I do today because I like cows. If things are really good, you can make a lot of money pretty fast. But if you don't hit it right, the potential to lose money is tremendous. Both the cows and many of the surviving farms are a lot bigger now, but it's not so clear how to read the signs of progress. As a psychologist, I was particularly interested in how pressures to get bigger affect relationships within dairy families and with their cows. To get a global picture of what's going on with modern dairies, I met with colleagues just north of the border at a working farm that's also the world's leading research center for animal welfare issues in the dairy industry. So I think what we're seeing globally, at least in the developed world, is this move to more animals on a farm, three or 4,000 cows. And so for a lot of people, this is in complete contradiction to their image of what the farm is. There's been a lot of critics that say that big is bad. I think we have to be careful when we say big is bad. We did some research on lameness, which is a big issue for dairy cows. And our research actually showed that larger farms had less lame cows, which is totally the opposite of what people expect. Once you have an economies of scale working for you, you can actually hire somebody that all that person does is identify lame cows. The person on the small farm, they have to do all these things all the time. Really, it's, it's a mixed bag. Some of these larger farms do a better job on some things. But because agriculture was what gave the country sort of its, its start, it's what everybody did 100 years ago, we don't want to let go of it too much. 
We like to have it in the way that it was so that we can look back and remind ourselves of our history and our tradition and all of these things. And maybe that's why some of the tension around the industrialization of agriculture, dairy farming in particular, strikes people as um, a more difficult pill to swallow. As I continued on my path through dairy country, I had to leave behind some of my own romantic notions about the small family farm. It was clearly more complicated than big versus small, and there are so many ways of judging good farming practices. But I was also wary of terms like industrializing, intensification, and growth, and what these terms meant for the farmers and for their cows. I feel good being around them because, I don't know, I, I think they like humans. My whole life I've been around cows, so I don't know any different. <laughs> I'm like the crazy cat lady, but with cows. <laughs> My dad's passion was more the cow side, like my brother Eric. That's kind of how I saw my opportunity was to go to the crop and the machinery side. Ever since I took that first weed eater apart, that worked perfectly fine when I was a kid. And obviously I didn't pay attention to how to put it back together, so it had to be thrown away. And, you know, my parents weren't too happy about that. My dad immigrated from Holland. He ended up marrying my mom, and then they took over this farm from my grandpa and grandma in 74. Every two years, they had another child, so they needed to keep growing. <laughs> so 12 kids later, and now we're 1,350 cows. Jason's the oldest and I'm tied for second. My twin brother's a minute older than me, so I'm third, so. <laughs> we didn't always have a real choice to go out and work, but as the more kids got in the farm, there wasn't as much of a need for our, my younger siblings to work. Nowadays, it's more specialized. We have people that scrape, people that feed, people that milk. There were some tough years, a lot of tough years, uh, very unprofitable. When times are tough, we get a line of credit. So in a sense, the bank kind of owns your farm if you borrow so much money. So then you have to pay that debt back. Just getting bigger doesn't solve your problems. You know, we, we always say get better before bigger. So if you, you all of a sudden want to get big and you don't have things figured out, you could lose everything. It actually goes pretty fast. Yeah, I go about 13 miles an hour, so. They say the first generation starts the farm, the second generation builds the farm, and the third generation destroys the farm. I just don't want to be part of the third generation. <laughs> My earliest memory is coming down the road, we were asking our parents, which place is it, which place is it, this place? No, not that place. And then we came, finally came down the road, and we said, is that place? Yep, that's the place. My folks were involved in chicken farming in Holland, so they were looking for opportunities of family and come to America. We milked 40 cows, and the cows were all pastured. So we always say that was the good times. 
was a lot less work and the cows were kind of on their own. My mom was probably involved more in the farm because we didn't have hired help in those days, so everybody had to pitch in. But now it's a little bit different. You have more hired help. We milk 400 cows. They're all confined. The philosophy was if you milk more cows, then you could hire people to help out so that you could also have a life. But the other side of the coin maybe is everybody expands and floods the market and your price is full. Kind of a vicious cycle. With my grandson coming in, we probably need to expand. All right, ready? You have a syringe with a needle? Okay, we're on. These are heifers that haven't had a baby yet, springers. And so we put new tags in like a week or two before they come fresh and they get vaccinated. It's all kind of like prevention type stuff, so. All right. They got the 48 Rio speed wagon that's resting well in the corner there. Rotary hoe from Bozeman Canning Company and the John Deere end manure spreader that we always called grandma's manure spreader because they delivered it on her birthday. Earlier days of farming, from the 20s all the way through the 50s, there was more of a trend towards diversified agriculture. So people had a smaller number of cows and they also would grow crops or have pigs or some other thing. Obviously, if you're milking cows by hand, you don't want to have big herds like we have now. After we were married in 89, my wife and I, one of the things that we wanted to do was switch over to a milking parlor. And, and my dad and uncle and I, we still milked in a 40 cow stanchion barn. One summer I milked a dairy farm that had 400 cows and it was six on the side. And you know, from four in the afternoon till about 10, 11 o'clock at night, you just milking the cows. My dad was real resistant to the milking parlor system. And now we're the first dairy north of Seattle to go to the robotic milking system. It's very common worldwide. It's just kind of a new thing in this area. All the cows have to have the RFID chip in their ear and then given milking permission on the computer. The stress that the cows go through in the automatic milking system is much less than in a milking parlor because they're able to milk more times a day and eat grain more times a day and live by their own schedule, it's less stressful. Some will just come right back in and they try it several times and they like, one time this one cow, I watched it like four times come in just within a few minutes that just really figured it out and there's some that just never figured it out and either are too timid or just just didn't want to go there. So we had to call a few cows that couldn't figure out how to use the machines, the robots. So we don't have the production like we should. And then it costs a little bit more than anticipated. This year, you know, it's been probably one of our most difficult years. In returning to this area, I also remembered my Aunt Annie and how hard she worked alongside Uncle Chape to manage the dairy. And I wondered about the lives of farm women today. 
Do daughters and wives have any different claims than in the past? And what futures do women have as workers, inspectors, and veterinarians, as well as owners? Corey is more of a physical part here. He loves the field work, the cows, and his wife's really into ag. They just, you know, they're a good fit for the farm. And so as the son, that's a good fit. Now, my like for my daughters, Grace loves animals, and we keep trying to encourage her to be a vet, but she just, I don't know. Wants she wants to marry a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> she's not, she's another. not getting married. <laughs> Never. Never. We just didn't start out like my brother did. You know, he was out on the farm when he was born. He was practically out there when he was an infant. And yeah, and it's different for me because I was always at home, you know, I just didn't get into it until I was like in sixth grade. I wish I was seven years old. I wish you were too. Then we wouldn't be so grown up, be we have better things to do. The baby calves have to be taken care of. And that's when me and Olivia come in. We've been getting up for school and helping my opa. Now I think about the taxes and how much money I spent. Opa, do you need more grain the down there? The crisper, make the bills real thin. Make the bills real thin. Trade the worth right out of them. Just trade. How much do you fill them up? That much? It's usually the boy that takes it on, but I mean, I love farming. I wouldn't trade it for the world, but I don't think I could ever take it over like my brother can. Okay, the rest are for the jerseys. I don't know what I'm gonna do. The exciting part is my daughter. She she loves animals and Marissa. you know she comes home and she wants to go see the animals and help. She helps yeah. feed calves and here. I think it takes a lot of caring and nurturing that you know that women are known better for. Tilt your head up. <laughs> Hopefully someday she's with me on the farm taking care of the animals. When I grow up, I want to be a farmer. I will milk the cows every day and every night. When I am 18 years old, I can milk the cows every day and every night. I want to be a farmer because I love, love cows. I really want to be a farmer. Marissa <laughs> Vanderkoy. That, that sounds like you want to be a farmer. <laughs> I got this one for Alan. Oh, one of his Christmases. And just John Deere, just, just remind me of Alan probably when he was little or something. So, yeah. I think we're getting full here. Yeah. Ben and Chelsea, uh, they're getting married next month and they plan to move in here. They need the space because they're going to start raising a family and this is the house to do it. Yeah. Plenty of rooms for all those little children. <laughs> yeah. What would you like your daughter-in-law to know coming into the house and a, a position you've had? Well, I know she's from a dairy background and so forth, but uh, and maybe things will be a little easier. Uh, for us, it was hard to get away on vacation. Mm -hmm. How was it decided that Ben got the house? 
Well, I didn't. I <laughs> didn't. <laughs> well, it's just, it's, you always need someone on the dairy, especially with the robotics. They're being milked 24 seven and Ben's willing to, and, and, but we'll probably have to, between Alan and Ben, you know, maybe, um, well, when Ben's, if he goes on vacation, um, Alan then will have to come down here and step in. Yeah. So. It seems to be tradition that the son or oldest son inherits the farm. Not always. I haven't really heard of a case where the girl inherits the farm. If my brother were to not be interested in the farm, I think I would have to take it over because I couldn't let it go under. I'd like to run the farm by myself, but we'll see how it goes and see how the inheritance breaks out. If we were like 10,000 acres and 10,000 cows, I mean, it'd be a different story, but you can't run a farm with 50 cows and 150 acres. It's just, it's too small. In our generation, we want to keep doing more. To keep improving, there's more money that has to go into it, which could potentially put you in the hole. The older generation, like Vicki and Alan, they want to you know, be able to pay it off and have a few good years instead of buying something really expensive and then not being able to pay for it later. <laughs> It's always the oldest male taking over the farm. There's a lot of pressure to try to carry that tradition and carry that burden. Every day all winter long, he feeds them grain and hay, cleans and beds their table, and furnishes them with pure, fresh water to drink. It's not the end goal of a farmer to raise dairy cows and slaughter them. In that sense, they're slightly unique from things like poultry, beef, or swine, for example. It's more of an eternal nurturing relationship. You hear the common phrase, I take care of the cows because they take care of me. Every cow gets trimmed once a year because if you don't trim their toes, they'll start walking funny and the toes will get too long, and then you'll have lame cows. In order to work on a cow, you can't have them standing. So they go in there, the strap goes underneath their belly, and then it tilts them to the side. Then he ties each foot up, and then he, he, he trims them all nice. But it's just like trimming your toenails. Most dairy farmers that I know are doing things to improve the comfort of cows. And it's not because we think a cow is like a human, it's because healthy cows produce a lot more milk. And so by using these techniques that we do, um, you know, we're making ourselves more profitable. Our bottom line is better. He's gonna walk through there and check the cows. Oh, there's a cow calving actually right now. The longest our newborn calves are with a cow is probably going to be between five and six hours. Is that a source of distress for the mother cow or the calf? The cow's over that in a little bit of time. It's a business. You have to do what's right for your farm. If you're not separating the difference between humans and animals, I mean, you can't even farm. You would never be able to farm that way. And a lot of people don't get that, especially non farming people, which there are a lot of them. I mean, it's an animal. They're made for us, okay? And, and that's the way I look at it. A 
how old are these calves? These calves, they're born, they're taken away from their mum, and then we usually house them individually from for about three to five days. We make sure that they're able to suckle well on the nipple, that you know that things are going well. And then we transition them from this into the group housing pen. So this mm -hmm. is not normal standard practice. Most farms uh -huh. still individually house calves. The images that circulate most in the anti-dairy world are the separation of cows and calves. Because, of course, most people can relate to being separated from a mother or a caregiver early in life. I don't say, look, you got to keep cows and calves together. It's not possible at the moment. We can't provide them their mum, but we can provide them social bonding, social contact with other calves. We did a series of studies where we took calves individually and pair housed them. And then about two, three weeks of age started training them to play a game. So we put them in a pen and at the back of the pen was a computer screen. They had to put their nose to a start box and then the computer screen would either be red or white. When it was red, that was their go sign. That meant that they had to run back to the back of the pen touch the screen, and then they got a milk reward. If it was white, they weren't allowed to go. All calves, regardless of whether or not they're raised individually or in pairs, are able to learn that task. Then we changed the rules. Where red was go, now white was go. Pair house calves, by the morning of the second day, they all of a sudden like this huge light bulb went off and they got it. The individually housed calves essentially never learned. We know that it can have profound impacts. Individually housed calves, is this why some of them really have trouble learning how to use the milk parlor? We don't know the answer to that yet. The group housing thing, I think, is good. I know guys that have done it, that have some luck. The biggest problem is they have to keep them separated for a while because you have to make sure that they all drink and you have to be able to look at the manure from every calf and you can see whether or not they're sick. This way, you put 10 of them in a pen or 20 of them and you don't know who's sick for sure. We're actually weaning them a little bit younger right now than we ordinarily would have because there was too many cows had calves at the same time and you had to wean them a little bit younger, which is not good. But you deal with what comes and this is what has come. So, uh, A lot of the economics has to do with how you care for the animals. If you're not very good with your cows, you're not very profitable. But I, I love the cows and I love working for them. It's not, I don't do it to make a dollar, so, so to speak, it's because I love working with animals. I got one cow I got to inseminate. If I don't prepare everything right, the, the semen will die. So you want it to keep it about 95 degrees. Yeah, so about, yeah, that's about warm enough. Keep I keep everything in my shirt next to, keep it about body temperature. We got rid of all our bulls about 11, 12 years ago, mainly because it was so unsafe. And well, one day I came across one of our bulls and he pinned me to the wall and started throwing me up and down and then he threw me over the wall. And I thought I was gonna die that day. And that was the last day we had a bull on the farm. It's safer for the cow too. Bulls weigh over a ton. And they chase the cows pretty good around the pen, so. We try to make the perfect cow, so whatever she's lacking in, we try to improve. Like the placement of the udder, how high it is attached, you'll probably see there's a couple of cows that the udder hanging more. 
We want udders that are well supported, they're gonna last. There, that's all it takes. In about nine months, you see the, the rewards of your labor. And it's nice to see a healthy calf come out. And yeah, it's kind of exciting, you know? I mean, I always tell my wife that Father's Day is a big day for me and she does, she never likes that when I say that. <laughs> The dairy cow is an amazing athlete. They produce so much milk and metabolically and physiologically there's so much going on in that, in that beautiful black and white body that we maybe can't appreciate from the outside. But because we've genetically bred for these cows to produce a lot of milk, we do put a lot of metabolic strain on them. So they're more inclined to have metabolic diseases or what we call like production diseases, which would include like milk fever or ketosis. These are diseases that are an outcome of high production. On average, genetic improvements in milk production per year are about 2%. So over time, I mean, many, many years ago, cows are producing 16, 18 kilos of milk a day, and now they're producing 35, 40, 45 kilos of milk a day. The costs of that were, first of all, fertility, so it's harder to get these cows pregnant. And number two is that there is a risk of disease. The farmer can't afford to have sick cows, but it is a reality. And I've said to farmers, I think in many ways, what you are in the business of is managing disease. See this 7880, that's a first calf heifer. Just looking at her general body condition, I'd say that she has something seriously wrong. She's really thin. It could be pneumonia, but if it is pneumonia, then probably you'll end up just putting her to sleep because they don't butcher cows that have pneumonia. They don't. So, That one there was stillborn, that little one there, because it's got the placenta is still hooked onto it. This one, I think, was an exceptionally big calf. The dead animal guy comes here three times a week. But I don't want to look at dead animals. This is the hospital. So all the cows with problems, they, they come to this place. And I try to help them here. Got to be, what, 11, 12 cows. So when we have uh, hundreds of cows out there, it's not so bad. A fresh cow is when they have the baby. Some of these cows, they get milk fever after they come fresh. I'm going to try to give it a bottle of calcium to see if she feels better. This one here, that one is a, a twin. One of the twins, that dead one right there. The other one is alive, but they, they born premature. If I have a dead calf, I want it out of my eyesight as fast as possible. It almost feels like you kind of wasted the animal because, because you couldn't at least eat it. You know, like if a like if a calf is born and then a month later she dies, you know, everything that mother carrying the baby, your work with the calf, it all got pretty much wasted. I mean, but if you can raise them to like this and then milk them for a while and and still get hamburger, then you succeeded. Yeah. I had a dairy farm at one time and got out of it. Dairy farm, I loved it. But it's to the point where there's a lot of rules, regulations, and it costs a lot of money now. It's a lot, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. Now I just haul cows. It's just, Ha <laughs> ha!
Okay, I'll get I'll get back in here a minute. Let's go. We're going for a ride, girls. Yeah, yeah. Come on. It was Come difficult, on. especially when I was younger because Come on. Come on. I got really attached to the cows pretty fast, but now that I grow you know, older, I know yeah. that it's, you, you can't keep them forever. And if they can't produce, then we're losing money. And unfortunately, that's the hard, cold truth we have to face, so. One of them was a heifer that uh, we weren't able to get bred for the first time. And the other two were cows that uh, were later in life and both um, weren't strong enough to stay with the herd. One real nice big cow brought 99 cents a pound. Um, the other one was 60, and 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 the cow that limped was 15 cents. So Ben and I got married in August. Sammy had already come out to Wisconsin. Alan and Vicky were gonna drive out. Um, so, um, it was, we went through the wedding. It was a great day. Um, they didn't make it, um, cause Vicky was still in the hospital. We got married on a Saturday and she passed on a Monday. It's hard. She had a really good hold on all the finances and I think that's one of the most important things. The farm can be so vulnerable. And she was excited to move out too. <laughs> move into the new house. Once she was gone, we were all kind of scrambling around. Once the milk truck come in, we had, we had to divide it all up, and she knew what to do with the money. If I'm like doing laundry, I'll be putting pants in there, and then I'll just hear a little voice. She'll be like, check the pockets. And I'm like, oh yeah, so what did I do? I'm like, just little things here and there. I, if I listen closely, I can kind of still hear her. A really, really good listener. That's probably the best quality of her. She always has the best advice. She was just overall a great mom. I think it's a nice life. I think watching my kids run around outside, being able to go wherever they want to is nice for them. It's tough though. It's not an easy life for the wife or the husband. I mean, the husbands are working 15 to 18 hours a day. And then the flip side of that is so are the wives. Oh, Leah will have your egg. No, I don't Because the it. wives take on the family. I worked off the farm in town. I was a loan processor for, I think, about 12 years. Hey, Andy. Do you want more milk? Uh -huh. If my girls want to go on you know, and Andy? pursue careers, I want them to do that. Thanks, bud.
I was very naive when we got married. I really didn't know much about dairy farming, but I've always been curious and analytical and asked a lot of questions. My sister-in-law and I work really well together with the numbers. We have the time and the patience to look at the tiny details. That frees our husbands up to look at the big pictures and make the big decisions. I really saw that my role was being able to be the one in between Eric and Jason and the employees. Our milkers had expressed that they would like a raise. Me and Eric sat down and talked about, is it the appropriate time? Do we think that it's earned? And then we came up with a number and then I was able to basically negotiate. I sat down and I offered them um, a pay increase and they agreed to it. Everybody gets, after one year of employment, gets one week paid vacation, and at two years of employment, you have two weeks of paid vacation. I've got it so that people work all the time. You know, if they're gonna be here, they need to be working for their shift, whatever it is. How do you handle sick time? Or... Here, you don't get sick very often. Do people get vacation time? Nope. They can take vacations. You don't think vacations are important? Yeah, but, well, we've gone to the South Pacific several times, uh -huh. so you've Cook Islands. some nice holidays. But yeah, uh -huh. but never the first 30 years. Oh, we're going to Fargo, is it North Dakota, for my son's wedding. Okay, you got it. My herdsman, who's been here for nine years, will be staying in my house, so he'll be running the farm. I do almost everything in the farm. Most of the time I take care of the cows. I give the medicine, or when they have their babies, they need uh, calcium. Les puedes chiflar poquito porque el ruido no es muy bueno y, y les puedes escuchar poquito pero no, no lastimarlas. No sé por qué lo hagan, pero no, eso no se tiene que hacer. Lastimar las vacas, no. There's no reason to do that to the animals. Now that it's seen how family farms were getting squeezed by pressures to grow or die, and how hard it was to keep afloat, I wanted to see where this trend toward larger dairies was leading us. I don't consider ourselves a factory farm. We're a family farm. Factory farm, I consider it negative. It's used by advocacy groups that usually are not in favor of large operations. Our animals are treated as well or better than anywhere in the world, and uh, we're proud of that. So as I walk around here, I, I look at the cleanliness of the udders. Just the overall cleanliness of the platform. These udders are looking, they look pretty good.
And what we do here is we maintenance everything 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We do preventative maintenance on a daily basis. Should we just climb over? We can just climb over, yeah. yeah. This will be the time we get stuck. <laughs> the potatoes are fed as a starch source, so that's one of the things we want to make sure we're getting that starch utilized and converted to milk. And the same with the corn, is that's our main, you know, starch is our main energy source. You want it to be able to hold its shape kind of in this pie form. If it's too liquid, I call that loose. And that, that would suggest to me that I didn't have the room and health quite dialed in and that I was leaning towards that side where it wasn't quite as safe as it should be. So we would move it back this direction to, to where it's just a little bit firm like this, but just barely holding its shape. This one's just a little bit looser, but still very good digestion. We're able to capture enough energy out of a waste stream that this large facility generates as a matter of course to power a city the size of Boardman, which is neighboring here uh, about twice that size, about 3,500 residences, maybe 10,000 population. That's what this power plant does. And it does it by commoner. When the baby's coming out, sometimes when they're big, so we help to give birth to that cow. One thing we always want to help is to open the nose so that she or he can breathe nice. If there is a baby born and the other cow, is not ready to stand up. Some cows, they help other cow to lick the baby so that the baby can be strong. Usually we give mom the chance to lick the baby. Then we take the baby away. I don't think size means anything. That's my personal opinion. I think that I could go out and, um, and buy an operation, and uh, if I wanted to milk cows, I could milk 100 cows and be successful. But I would structure it properly before I did that. Okay, I, would go, I, I, I can sit here and look at you in the eye, and I can say that. It's a free market. Milk's a commodity. In today's uh, volatile feed cost environment, 
dairymen have experienced very high feed prices and low milk prices. And a lot of dairymen have gone out of business because of that. We have an ideal structure here. We've got ample farmland to feed our cows. That trajectory of winners or losers has left a lot of losers in the wake. Well, I think, you know, it's, it's just like any business. Uh, consolidation is just a natural evolution. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cruel world, world out there in every industry. Uh, so you have to become efficient, you have to compete, and some are better at competing than others. There was a strike back in 2003 at Three Mile Canyon. Workers stopped working and they came to us um, seeking help because of the conditions that they were enduring there. Um, from not having lunch breaks to wage and hour violations. It was a fight. It was a four year fight. Workers now get medical benefits, paid vacation, they work 12 hours, six days a week, and then they get two days off. And more importantly, having access to better working conditions from having protective equipment, lunch rooms, water, having an, a specific time for them to take their lunch. Those are part of the benefits of their contract. By many measures, this was a factory, and a very well-run factory. The size of the operation permitted a level of organization and control difficult to achieve for small-scale operations. And as I had seen, even the smaller farms were industrializing, adopting new technologies and hiring workers to stay profitable. But I questioned the idea that consolidation of the industry is inevitable some kind of natural law. And I wondered how farmers themselves struggled with these volatile economic forces. If current trends continue, we'll have a handful of dairy farms, or maybe there'll be one someday that will be producing all of the products. I think most people find that thought uh, not a very welcome one. Balancing supply and demand historically has not been something that U.S. dairy farmers are um, particularly eager uh, to have the government step in and do for them. They would prefer that it was left to sort of the markets to decide. We know that that model results in attrition. Approximately 90% of the dairy farmers that were farming in 1970 in the U.S. no longer are dairy farming. The fluid market is shrinking every year, so processors are drying more milk and exporting. And as we find out, we're more reliant upon the export market for our prices. We just had the perfect storm in 2008. We had plenty of cheap feed. We had banks more than willing to lend us money at more than what we needed. So that just caused everybody to overexpand, to overproduce. So if we did make some milk, there was no problem. We'd just export it out of the country. But when those export markets crashed, you know, that put all that milk to, on the domestic market. And that, you know, that just that put a hurt on us, like, in a hurry. So you get ready for this market, and then they quit buying. Now then, what do you do with this product that you spent a tremendous amount of money to be able to produce? We saw that price in 2008, um, forecasted out into 2009, and we went out and used the uh, financial contract on the CME exchange and locked in our milk price. So what the Chicago Mercantile Exchange allows farmers to do, it allows them to kind of take some of the price risk out of their formula. But you have to have money in an account, a certain margin set aside. 
we've got in this thing with the futures and I do not do that because the person that's offering the contract has way more information than you have. That's what they do all day. They're gonna outguess you. You are going to lose money. Every producer made a conscious decision in 09. Is it worth writing it out or is it time to sell? At the end of 08, things were getting tight. And at that time, we decided to put a bid in to get our cows bought out. And I just remember coming home from school one day and all the cows were being loaded up into these big trailers and I was bawling my eyes out because mm. I was like, that was scary, you know? Is the farm like coming to an end or something like that? Remember how but, eerie the farm was? Yeah, and empty? it was just quiet. Just All the cows were gone. There was no milking going on. There was no calves to be fed. It was just kind of scary and didn't really know what to do. Mm. Everybody mm. felt that great. Yeah, you know? Yeah. Don't know what was going to happen. It was, it yeah. was tough. What we did is we kept our young stock, and as they freshened, we just started milking started everything milking ourselves. Yeah. We didn't know if we were going to keep dairy farming, but, you know, it, it's just like, well, what else are we going to do? You know, I mean, we have this farm here, and we have to do something with it, and so that's when we decided, well, we're just going to start milking, and that's what we did. Mm -hmm. I was the one that really wanted to take over the farm. In 2004, we bought the real estate from my parents, and we're still 50-50 owners in the cows and the equipment with my parents. and. Uh, I kind of like it that way, but you know, eventually I'm going to have to buy the other half. And you still have to be able to make that payment in the low times. The last thing I want to do is be calling up my parents and saying, hey, guess what, you're not getting anything this month. I want to make sure that they can retire. I mean, that's what it's all about, right? I mean, they want to get to the end and have something at the end, and I, I get that. So that's part of the intergenerational contract in a way. Yes, yes. But, but the problem is farm values and land values have gone up, but the milk price doesn't always reflect that. And so you got to deal with the milk price that can't sometimes afford to do that. After the toil of the day is over, our prosperous dairy farmer, his fair wife, stalwart sons, and beautiful daughters sometimes assemble on their well-kept lawn for rent and recreation. They are not worried about the future because they have been successful in building up a high-producing herd of dairy cows. It's been wonderful of you to send us all to school and give us such a lovely home, too. Yes, Mary, but remember, it was the cows. Everything we have, we owe to our high-producing dairy cows. The traditional way of doing things may not always been the ideal way. It's easy to sort of idealize it when you weren't a part of it. The survival of a family farm depends on the next generation to keep it going. Passing it on requires deciding how to value the contributions of different family members. The stakes are high since land values are considerable, even for the smallest farms. Yet questions about who gets the farm or how it's divided up are not just about money. Inheritance is rarely just about money. So here's my brother's house now, no longer mine. It's weird to say that after living in there for 17 years. And we're going over for a little dinner to talk about the farm and what to do with dividing it up and what happens next. And I've been through all this before because my grandma and my mom and my dad uh, all passed about the same time within a couple of years uh, and everything fell to me and so. Um, my thought was if the kid is interested then they should get it, not divided up equally or in half if one or the other is not interested. Well, I never said I wasn't interested though. It sure doesn't seem like it. I'm focusing on college, Ben. It's. <laughs> Time consuming. I don't know, after 
school and once I get my certificate, degree, whatever, I do want to have some part of this farm. I don't want to be like totally cut off from everything. When the farm's paid for, it would be nice to grow the farm a little bit so that it's, it's big enough for a couple of families to cash flow on. You know, at some point, you know, the dairy will, the dairy will have to get a little bigger in order to, mm -hmm. in order to keep going. And, um, but there's some pretty exciting changes out there with the way technology is going, you know, with the... I'm pushing to be the owner of the farm sooner now that my mom's passed. You know, there's a big inheritance tax. Um, so you have to get things in your name over time slowly so you don't have to pay a big inheritance tax. I mean, I hope to keep the same relationship with my sister and dad. I mean, I don't want to have to leave, but if things don't work out, then I'm not going to stay here and not get what I've worked for my whole life. How old are you now? 23. It's a lot of responsibility to carry for someone. Yeah, it's a lot of responsibility for a 23-year-old. That's why I already got like two or three gray hairs. <laughs> The debt has to be passed on or else my dad will never retire. My dad's plan was for me to have the Burke house and 75 acres, and Ben would have the cows, the rest of the land, the equipment, the farm, basically. I know he deserves like the majority, but he doesn't need to like cut me out completely. The last six, seven years, we went up to Dad and said, hey, we want to be part owners of this. We don't want to just keep working for you. He didn't really want to, but there are only so long you can work for your dad. It's a business, and it's a family. That's where a lot of the conflict and the issues come up. My twin brother, you know, he, he's now in the banking world. And when we signed the papers, he actually was kind of hurt because, you know, he grew up right next to me, doing everything on the farm, was part of all this through the struggles and all the work. And then all of a sudden, you know, when he heard that we signed the papers, it's like the door got shut on him to ever come back to the farm. When I told my dad I was going to seek employment elsewhere, I remember that being a fairly difficult time for me. Need a hand there, Jace, or what? No, not going back <laughs> Coming back to the farm, I, I realized that, not that I'm afraid of hard work, but there was a lot of labor-intensive work and didn't know if I was, that was the path I wanted to go. Didn't want to give him that hope that I was going to come back and, and fill a role on the farm. But I also didn't want to completely close the door either. You know, there's 12 siblings. There's just no way the farm could support 12 kids. They see it as us getting handed the farm, the younger kids. I think it's easier for the siblings to just look at the, the value and what mom and dad are gonna get back. I would think that probably they're thinking about their inheritance too. <laughs> mom and dad set us up with the great uh, opportunity we have today, but then with that, we have the responsibility to take care of them for the rest of their life too. If I sold this as a dairy farm, I'd get about the same amount of money as if I sold the land for berries. For it to stay a dairy farm, yeah, it works, but if you borrowed all that money, you probably would have trouble paying for it. But you have two grandsons who are interested. Yeah, but it's gonna be how, how much they're interested. I am kind of grandpa's right-hand man, I guess. Do whatever he doesn't want to do. Yeah, 7598 needs to be out of 1010. 7598. My whole life, this is what I've wanted to do. I've gone out, I've worked a couple different industries, and I always wind up wanting to come back to the farm, to go out and buy a farm, 
buy the cattle, buy the equipment. You know, we're talking millions of dollars, you know, to even start a, a small farm. It's tough because Grandpa plays his cards so close to his chest, I don't know what his long-term plan is. Yeah. And now by bringing my cousin on board, if I were him, if I had any intention of selling, I don't think I'd be bringing on more family members. It used to be you could work hard because your, your labor was a big part of it. You didn't really put much money in, you put your labor in. Today, your labor is only worth whatever the cheapest person you can hire to do your job. I guess what we need to impress upon them is that you're not making money unless you're milking cows. So if you got some unhooked here, you got some unhooked here, and you're spending lots of money, but you're not making any. So that's the, the biggest thing. It's a lot easier if it's something smaller. You get to the point where there's, you're talking about too much money. That's just going to be something where everybody's going to hate each other and it won't take very long. People get married, they get divorced. From now, you just gave half of it to somebody that didn't have anything to do with you at all. And they're not even friends anymore. So I might have just well went to the Lighthouse Mission and gave somebody that I'd never seen before what I worked 50 years for. For a good charity. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of, uh, well, I don't know. Life is way too complicated. The industrializing of dairy has delivered many farmers from the burdensome toil of the past and has created new forms of skilled work. But the pressure to intensify and industrialize has brought new problems to manage as well, from production diseases for the animals to massive debt and the increasingly harsh conditions of the market. I'm sure that my Uncle Chape felt some of these same pressures to adapt to conditions over which he had little control. And like the producers who still work these same fields, he must have felt so acutely aware of the farm's vulnerability and the precariousness of life itself. We hope that there are farms in this valley 100, 200 years from now and that they can look back on previous generations and understand where we were and how we kept the farms going. Nobody wants to be the family that went out of business because everybody's going to be talking about you. No farmer wants to be in that conversation. They want to be, oh yeah, we're milking so many cows and we have so many acres. And after so many generations, we're still continuing. There's a place, a garden for the young, to laugh and dance and safety among the shimmering light and the shade of the trees. Steal a bite and paradise lost With dark hearts we didn't count the cards Forgot all we left behind It's only maybe one or two families could live off this farm, depending on what the cows are doing in milk prices and feed prices. The bigger dairies have more buying power and more, more pull with the bank or, or with land or what's going on in the county. But we're still proud to be dairy farmers, no matter how big or small, we're still dairy farmers, and I'm proud to say that. Turn around and let back in the light. Enjoy will come. Lock a bird in the morning sun. And Seems 
just rock to a man Till it's in overhead and it don't understand How the plans he made only let him astray But if a good gift come down from above From the Lord alive like a labor of love Upon the child who waits for him Sometimes you find what you're waiting for It's all along just waiting for you To turn around and reconcile That it may be broken down All the bridges burn like an old ghost town But this my son can be made new 